You're watching the sermon of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's sermon is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. If you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2, Romans 2 will be looking at verses 12 through 16. Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. As you are turning there, let me ask you this. Can we be a gospel-preaching church if we do not preach on sin and wrath? Can we be a gospel-preaching church if all we preach is the love of God, but never the justice of God? and his righteous judgment. There are many who tell us not to preach on wrath, sin, and judgment. Because we preach on those things, that, that can sound hateful. And people don't want to hear about those things. Now, there was a famous preacher a number of years ago who said, you will never win the loss by preaching on sin and wrath, but just tell them God loves you. Jesus died for you. And if that's what we say, and if that's all we say, have we really preached the gospel? To leave out sin and wrath and judgment in our preaching and teaching is to leave out what the gospel saves us from. It's to not understand why we need the gospel. It's to miss that we are separated from a holy God that we are enemies of this God in of ourselves, in our rebellion towards him who created us for himself, and that we have incurred then his wrath. And as we think of what the scriptures say, what did the apostle Paul say the gospel is? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and on the third day rose again according to the scriptures. And then he went on to say how he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and on to to those that he appeared to, in the order he appeared there in his resurrection. But again, we see the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. So can we really preach the gospel and leave out any notion of sin, wrath, and judgment? I've always liked uh, the Alistair Begg quote, so I thought this was a good opportunity to throw it in here, (laughs) Uh, where he said, it is because God's wrath is real that his mercy is relevant. Without a real wrath, a real anger towards sin, the biblical concepts of the mercy and long-suffering of God are robbed of their meaning. He's right. And as we think about this, to leave out sin, wrath, and judgment is also to leave out any understanding of what Christ actually accomplished on the cross. On the cross, Jesus stood in the place of wrath as God punished Jesus as the substitute in place of his people so that God's justice would be satisfied and his people could go free. So we have to understand, we cannot leave out the biblical truths concerning wrath, sin, and judgment. So then, in not leaving them out, what exactly is their relationship to the gospel proclamation? I think I've already alluded to it, but as we go through this passage, I think we'll see very specifically what their relation is. So as we have been working through Romans, and we've been seeing Paul's defense of his thesis, that that thesis you find there in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, when Paul says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, to the Gentile. And it's the power of God for salvation, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And Paul shows how all are in need of righteousness from God. 
as he shows, at least up to where we are here in Romans, as he has shown that the Gentiles are under sin, as they have suppressed the truth in unrighteousness, which leads to their idolatry. And so because of man's idolatry, God has poured out his wrath, uh, this wrath that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This wrath, which in that context there in chapter 1, is God giving up mankind to and, and consigning mankind over to the fullness of their depravity and enslavement to sin. And then as we got into chapter 2, we saw Paul begin to transition from showing the Gentiles unrighteousness to showing the sinfulness of the Jews and how they are under condemnation and so without righteousness. And I argued that in that transition, which we continue here in this morning, in that transition, Paul is speaking to both Jews and Gentiles. And then he'll eventually specifically address the Jews in verse 17. And Paul started this transition by pointing out how the moralist, uh, the one who would look with superiority on those whom practice the things that Paul mentioned there in chapter 1. Uh, the moralist who would judge those who practice such things. Paul showed that that moralist is just as morally bankrupt as those they judge. And so they store up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. And then finally, last week, we saw how God judges without partiality. But he judges according to what each one has done. And we had discussed how in examining one's work, no one is good before God. No one does what is right. We've all done evil, for we are evil and have earned God's wrath and fury. So now this morning, we continue here in chapter 2. As we look specifically this morning at verses 12 through 16, we see these verses show us that God shows no partiality in his judgment. And so whether Gentiles without the law or Jews under the law. And as Paul talks about here, as we'll read, uh, those who are without the law and those who are under the law, it is clear that he is making the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. And the context makes that clear. And now Paul has already mentioned such distinctions as we've been going through this. And, and verse 14 will make it all the clearer, as we'll see. We see God's written law was given to his chosen people, Israel, to the Jews. But we see that that gave the Jews no advantage when it came to God's judgment. Though they possessed the written law that was handed down to them through Moses, though they possessed God's special revelation of himself in his high moral standard. Having been given this, if anything, it really just held them more accountable as they had been given more light in this revelation. And they did not uphold that standard. They did not uphold what that light required. And yet, the Jews believe that as God's chosen people with God's law, that they did have an advantage before him. Even those Jews in the first century that professed Christ. Some, as we've seen as we've been working through Acts in Sunday school, some argue that it was necessary to have the law, necessary to be Jewish, in order to be known as God's people, to know God's blessing, to be saved. But no, the law, being Jewish, gave no one an advantage before God who judges without partiality. At the same time, the Gentiles would not be let off the hook just because they did not have the law. And so in our text for this morning, the Apostle Paul shows how he can say that God, who gives to each one according to his work, shows no partiality. And in the flow of this text, we see that in verse 12, both the Gentiles without the law and the Jews with the law will come into judgment. And then many argue, and I really think it's right to say that as you come to verses 13 and 15, we should see those verses as parenthetical. 
uh, that Paul is stepping aside from his main thought to explain what he says there in verse 12. Or as some have said, that he's, he is showing the, the argument for verse 12 for those who would kick back against what he says. And so we see, as you come to verse 13, he explains how the Jews with the law will be judged by the law, while in verses 14 and 15, he shows how Gentiles will perish without the law. And then as he continues his thought from verse 12 and verse 16, he speaks there of final judgment through Christ Jesus. And so that's, that's where we are here this morning. And so let's together look at our text. And if you would read along with me as I read chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So in verse 12, those who had not received the written law, that that special revelation from God that was handed down through Moses, those who did not have the law, those who sinned without the law, without the law also will perish. And the idea of perish here, in this context, in this section that focuses on God's wrath, it clearly refers to the eternal just punishment of God under his wrath. And since since it's in the future tense, uh, this would be perishing under the wrath of God that he pours out on the day of wrath that that we discussed last week. On that day, those who sin without the law Without the law, they will also perish. But again, he he doesn't let the Jews, though, off the hook either, just because they have the law. For we also read, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. They'll be judged by the law, by the standard of the law. Though the Jews have the law, they'll still, though, be found guilty being judged by the standard of the law. We see that as verse 13 makes it very clear. Paul says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So they will stand before God as guilty as well. Because it's not just the fact that they've heard the law. It's not just the fact that they had been taught the law since childhood. Growing up in a Jewish home, it's not just the fact that, that every Sabbath they, they would go to the synagogue and hear Moses read there, and so would hear the law, be taught the law, be instructed in the law. That, that's, that's not alone what will make them right before God. No, but instead they have to actually do what the law required if they're going to be right before God in of themselves. They have to meet those requirements. They're the ones who will be righteous before God. And it should be pointed out here that those who are righteous before God, this is referring to God's ruling when he passes down his verdict. And so this is referring to a legal or forensic justification being declared righteous. So for one whose life has been examined by the holy judge, and being examined, have been found to have kept the standard of the law in all that they have done, that one will be legally declared righteous. That's the verdict. But once again, we have to ask, who has actually kept the standard of the law, right? And we've discussed already, no one has. Not a single one. No one will stand before God in their own work and be declared righteous. 
And so again, in this context where, where Paul is, is showing that all mankind, whether uh, Gentile or Jews, they're, they're all unrighteous before God. They all deserve judgment. In this context, Paul is not saying that there is anyone who will actually have kept the standard and be right within themselves. No, instead what Paul is doing here is he's showing the basis for God's judgment. That's his point. And so the Jew, with God's law, will be judged under the law according to the standard of the law. And according to that standard, he will be found guilty. And therefore, he will perish. And I think as we look at this, even though Paul is explaining why the Jew with the law will be judged according to the law, I think there's application for us here. As we think about how, you know, in, in our own evangelism, for example, if you're talking to someone about the gospel and, and whether or not someone is right before God in of themselves, whether or not they, they think they're a good person, whether they'll, they'll go to heaven, and you hold up the standard of God before them, and they, they admit, yes, they, they have not upheld that standard. But, but one of the kickbacks that someone may often give is, yeah, but, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. You know, I, I grew up going to church, or I do go to church every Sunday. And, and those situations uh, may have given them great knowledge and light of, of what the truth is. They, they may have heard the revelation of God, but, but again, it's, it's not the hearer. It's not just because they've heard that it will make them righteous. And so they cannot stand and justify themselves before God because of how they grew up. No, no more than the Jew can justify themselves before God because they grew up hearing the law, hearing it in the home, hearing it every Sabbath. That's not what will make a person right before God. It's not the hearer of the law, but the doer of the law. See, because the issue is not having the law or, or not having the law. The issue isn't how you have heard the law or heard the revelation of God. The issue really, as each one stands before God, is each one has sinned. That's the issue. And so we all stand before God as guilty, as God will render to each one according to what he has done. If you have grown up going to church, or if you did grow up in a Christian home, maybe that did give you some more light. Maybe you were, if you were truly taught God's word, if you were truly taught the gospel, maybe that gave you more light. But, but just having that more light in of itself, if you did nothing with it, that, that doesn't do anything for you. If anything, it just makes you more accountable to that light that you've been given. So again, we see how the Jews with the law will be judged by the law. But how can the Gentile without the law perish when they've never been given God's holy standard? Can they be expected to do what the law says they're to do when they were never given the law? Well, Paul answers that. As he furthers his argument here in verse 14, saying, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. So, since there are times when unbelievers do what the law requires of them to do in their outward behavior, that demonstrates that they have a knowledge of that standard naturally. A moral standard is innate to all mankind, as God has placed it in them, having created mankind in his image, having revealed himself in creation. And we can see this. There is a, a common moral standard among men. Many have pointed out that you can look at all the different civilizations throughout history and you can look at the different laws and rules that each one has made. And, and you can look throughout the world today, and, and there are common moral standards. Where each sees murder and adultery and theft 
as wrong and, and judge them as wrong. And, and many of those societies have punishment for those things. And there are things that a person in all their depravity would say they would never do. Things that they would be ashamed of if anyone found out they did them. They have this standard, this guide, this knowledge. Again, we could look back to chapter 1 and see there in verse 32. Even the things they themselves do, they know such things deserve death. And so, as Paul says, they are a law unto themselves. In other words, human beings are moral beings. And Paul pushes this thought further, saying in verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. It's there by nature. Some call this a natural law. Now, many point out, and I think rightly so, that what Paul says here is not that the law of God is written on their hearts. And it's important, I think, to point out because some teach this as if that is what Paul is saying. As if what he's saying here is the same of what we read through the prophet Jeremiah. As we see in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 33. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So what's in view here in Jeremiah? Well, this is the new covenant promises, which, as opposed to the old covenant, the fuller knowledge of God there would not be just this external standard to strive for, but the standard would be made internal through a transformed heart where the law demands obedience but gives no power to obey, the external law and the Mosaic covenant uh, that was a law that could be sought after and would be failed, a law that could be sought after with wrong motives, where one could try to stand on their own righteousness, their own self-righteousness, with outward behavioral change that, that had no effect on the heart which therefore would be no lasting change, no genuine change, and, and so would not lead to an actual obeying of the law. But instead, the new covenant promised obedience from a changed heart, out of love for the Lord, through a new birth, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the law written on the heart. Here in Romans 2, on the other hand, Paul refers to not the law, but the work of the law written on the heart of those without the written law. In other words, what's written in every man's heart is the knowledge of right and wrong. Man instinctively knows it's wrong to lie. Man instinctively knows it's, it's wrong to murder. We instinctively know these things as the work of the law is written on our hearts. And so each one, though they do not have God's written law given by Moses, they still know God's standard. We've stated many times that before any one of us were believers, before we were saved, and if we're honest, even after having been saved, We've all done things that we knew were wrong. Uh, things that we knew were wrong even before we did them, and we still did them. We've all violated this standard. And knowing God's standard then, the one without the law, their conscience bears witness. One's conscience has been described as an alarm system that goes off when you do something wrong. 
Or as John Calvin said in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he called the conscience the guardian appointed for man, or an inner witness and monitor. One's conscience measures how well they have upheld that moral standard that they know. We've all had the experience of doing something wrong, and in that very moment that we did what was wrong, we had that instant regret, that instant guilt and shame. And true guilt, true shame, is actually a good thing. Uh, There is a selfish and um, self-pity guilt. But true guilt is good, even though the world tells us that we should never feel guilt. The world tells us that we should ignore our conscience, ignore that alarm system, and people do. And that's where we see in Scripture about a seared conscience. A conscience that's been calloused over, a conscience that has been broken because someone has ignored it so much that it doesn't work anymore. They've lost its sensitivity or all feeling, and therefore they live without a moral compass. They, they dive headlong into their sin. And that could be as individuals or as a society. But this is not because they have not known right and wrong but because they have gone ignoring that internal alarm system until they have silenced that alarm. But guilt that is in direct relation to our sinful behavior is a good thing. It tells us we've done what is wrong. It tells us that there's something broken. It tells us that what we've done is evil. So the conscience bears witness. But not just the conscience. Also, each one's thoughts. They're thoughts that, one, accuse them. Again, each one knowing that they have done what is wrong, that they have done what is sinful, that they, they have a conscience that is a mess, and their guilt presses in with their thoughts. They know. But not only, too, does their thoughts accuse them, but Paul says here their thoughts also may excuse them. You know that They recognize, yeah, I've done these things wrong, but you know, I'm really not a bad person. I may have done these things over here, but, but there's plenty of things that I have done that's good and right, right? I've done plenty of good. I am a good person. You know, how many times have I helped Mrs. Murphy cross the street? You know, even as a kid growing up, I always obeyed my parents, mostly. I've done a lot of good. I'm good, right? Their thoughts accuse and excuse them. And yes, there are things that we've all done that are good outwardly, would be considered good. But remember what we went over last week. Nothing is truly good when it's done through an impure motive. And the only Truly good motive, pure motive, is is the motive when something is done for the pleasure and honor and glory of God. Plus, no matter how much supposed good we've done, we all still stand guilty as being violators of God's holy standard. All of us. Even those who do not have the law. And some of the things they do in the witness of their conscience and their thoughts, accusing or excusing, they show they know God's standard. They show they have the work of the law written on their hearts. So what excuse will anyone have? No one can say they didn't know God, right? We already said creation screams that God exists. And no one will be able to say they did not know God's standard. It's written on their heart. And there's all the evidence and all the witness that shows it. So again, we see in verses 13 through 15, Paul is showing how he can say what he does there in verse 12 about judgment. So now then, as we come into verse 16, he continues that original thought on judgment. As verse 16 says, on that day. On what day? 
on that day when those without the law will perish and those with the law will be judged by the law. On, on that day. And on that day is when God judges the secrets of men. And so it's clear, as we've mentioned before, uh, that God does not just judge the outward actions of anyone. He doesn't just judge the things that everyone knows. But God will also judge those things that have not been known by anyone else except him. Those secret things, those hidden things, the things that any one of us would cower and shake if those things became public. Such things that we may think we've gotten away with. Things of the mind, fantasies, secret ambitions, motivations of the heart, things done in the dark and done behind closed doors. We may have gotten away with it with someone else, our spouse, our kids, the government, the whatever. But before God, we don't get away with anything. Nothing is hidden from God, and so nothing will escape his judgment. As the conditions of our hearts are laid bare before him. So all will be brought into judgment before God. And how will God execute this judgment? And we see here, this judgment will be carried out by Christ Jesus. Christ is the one who will execute this judgment. He is the one whom every last person will stand before to give an account. We see this explained too in Jesus' own words in the Gospel of John chapter 22, or chapter 5, verses 22 to 27. It says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he also grants the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. The Father has every right to judge. Yet as equal with the Father, the Son judges, so that both the Father and the Son will be honored. And you cannot honor the Father unless you also honor the Son whom he sent. And Christ, as God, has all authority to judge. And so we see here, too, that even in the incarnation, the Father has given an authority over to the Son to judge. And notice how the the right of the Son to judge is connected to his incarnation. As we read there in verse 27, it says, because he is the Son of Man. As the one who came in all humanity, in full humanity, to represent sinful man before the Father. The one who came as the second Adam to succeed where Adam failed. He has the right to judge Adam's race. We see how J.C. Ryle put it when he said, It is because he humbled himself to take our nature on him and be born of the Virgin Mary that he will at length be exalted to execute judgment at the last day. It is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom God will execute his judgment. And that's exactly what we see here in Romans chapter 2. Now notice, as Paul is talking about that day when God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus, Paul here in verse 16 says that this is according to his gospel. And he says, according to my gospel. 
So we have to ask the question, what does Paul mean when he says, my gospel? Did he mean my gospel as opposed to your gospel? You know, saying that you know, there's many different gospels out there. There's all kinds of gospels, and, and this just is my gospel. You know, you have your gospel, you know, I have my gospel, you know, your, your truth, and there's my truth, and, you know, truth is really relative, and so, you know, what, what works for you, you do you, and it's all lollipops and roses, right? Is that what Paul means by my gospel? No, clearly not. Uh, that would actually be to take a, a more modern philosophy and impose it on Paul there in the first century. A philosophy, by the way, that comes out of what we see there in chapter 1. A philosophy that says that truth is relative is really just a philosophy that suppresses the truth in their unrighteousness. So no, that's not what Paul is saying here. So what is Paul saying? He can't mean that he preaches just one of many gospels that's out there, Because although it's true, there is a sense in which there are many Gospels out there being preached, it's not true that all of those Gospels are actually Gospels. That they are the Gospel. And that's clear. Uh, Earlier than he wrote Romans, he wrote his letter to the Galatians. The Galatians who had wandered from the Gospel. And he said this to them in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let him be an anathema. And the idea of that word is to be eternally condemned. Any other gospel is no gospel at all. There is only one gospel, only one good news for sinners who are under the wrath of God. And so what does Paul mean by my gospel. Paul means that this is the gospel he heard, the gospel by which he was saved, and so to the gospel that was entrusted to him with apostolic authority, that he would proclaim this gospel faithfully and proclaim it to the Gentiles. And so of this gospel, the one true gospel, Paul takes ownership of it as he's been given responsibility. He takes ownership of it. And I think this is the same idea. And he says, my gospel, that we see in chapter 1, verse 16, when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed. He's not going to disown it in any way. No, he's going to fully embrace it and take it in as his own. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. This is why Paul was eager to preach the gospel in Rome, because he was not ashamed. He would not disown this gospel, but he embraces it fully, eager to proclaim it, because it is such good news. It's such glorious news, that which is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And do you know that? Do you recognize that? Do you really recognize it? That the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God is not in our tactics. The power of God is not in how well we explain things. The power of God is not how appealing or winsome we are to others. The power of God is not in making church attractive to the outside world. That's not the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And so, do you believe? Do you truly believe this gospel? That in yourself there is no hope, no way, no life in you. No reason you should be found as good before the holy God. There is nothing in you but reason to be judged. 
And so believe the gospel that says the only hope there is for you is not in you, but in Jesus Christ. That there is no righteousness, nothing good in you, but Jesus Christ is your righteousness. This is the gospel, the power of God for all who believe. Do you believe? Do you believe the gospel of the one who came to satisfy God's wrath against you in your place so that not one drop of it would ever come to you? Do you believe the gospel? It is true. Jesus alone saves. Don't try to stand on anything good about you. There's nothing good about you, as there's nothing good about me. Stand on the goodness of Jesus. Rely and depend on the goodness of Jesus and his righteousness and his work to satisfy God's justice in your place. Only Jesus saves. And so Paul's saying that this is according to my gospel. He's saying this is according to the gospel. That's what he means. But again, now we have to look at this and say, okay, what is he saying is according to the gospel? It's judgment. That's what he's talking about here. Judgment. Again, he says, on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So again, that day when those who without the law will perish without the law, and those with the law will be judged by the law. But how can that be according to the gospel? Right? Because the gospel, what does that mean? It means good news. Is judgment good news? No, that's bad news. So how can judgment be according to the gospel? Well, one, brothers and sisters, we've said that we have to understand the bad news if we're really going to understand the good news, right? That there is no way for us to really grasp and understand, and there's no way to really appreciate just how good the good news is if we don't know the bad news. We need to know about judgment and wrath. And plus, what is it to talk about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection? To claim, proclaim Jesus saves when there's no understanding of what he saves from. To just say, God loves you, Jesus died for you, with no call to repentance, no real understanding of the gospel. Why would we do that? If we're afraid. If we're afraid of what other people might think. We don't want to offend anybody because we're really more concerned about what they think about me. I want them to like me more than I'm really caring about their eternal soul. The full gospel proclamation includes sin, wrath, and judgment. And we must preach the full gospel. The gospel that says God is God. He made us and we belong to him. He is holy and we are not. And what is a holy God to do with me who is not holy? He who is perfectly righteous demands perfect righteousness. But instead we've lied, we've stolen, we've been ungrateful. Although we knew God, we did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But in the depth of our depravity and our darkened hearts, we embraced idolatry, hating God, earning only his wrath for ourselves. And God, who is just, must give us what we've earned. The good news includes the bad news. And then we see how good the good news is. That God became a man, Jesus Christ, 
who as God is perfectly holy and just. And so as a man lived a perfectly holy and just life. And being that perfect life, he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice on the cross where God the Father credited Jesus with all of the sin of all who would believe on him. That he would take the just punishment that each one of us deserves in our place. That he would satisfy the wrath of God for us. That he died under the judgment of sin for the wages of sin is death. But he did not stay dead. No, he rose again on the third day. And my Savior, my Lord, lives to never die again. And as long as he lives, my salvation will be secure. So my friends, if you will turn from your sin, not that you become perfect in this life, but as you see the love of God in sending Christ into the world, as you see how your Savior loved you and gave himself for you, As you know and believe such love, how could you not love him in return? And if you love him in return, how can you continue the things that you know are an offense against him? You can't. No, but with such gratitude and such love, you recognize him who is your Lord. And you seek to please him in all that you do. You you hate your sin. You no longer make excuses for your sin, but you turn away from it. And turning from your sin, you turn to Jesus Christ by faith, putting your full trust in him and in him alone for your salvation. For only Jesus saves. And when you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, God will credit to you all of the righteous works of Jesus Christ, all of the law-keeping life that he has lived. He will look upon you as if you live that life. And that sin-paying death of Jesus becomes your payment for sin. That everything that was Jesus's is now yours. As God looked at Jesus on the cross, as everything that was yours, your sinful life, was his, and he punished him as if it was. That God's justice would be satisfied. That you can go free and live. My friends, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you will go free. If you trust in Jesus Christ, your sin will be settled before the Holy God is settled before the Holy God. And you will have eternal life. Trust in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. My friends, this is the gospel. The true gospel. The full gospel. There is no gospel apart from this. This gospel that, yes, includes judgment and wrath. Brothers and sisters, we we do no one any favors by not preaching the true gospel. All are under condemnation and sin and will stand before their creator without an excuse. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And so let's call others to Christ. Let's call others proclaiming the gospel and call them to believe. Do you believe the gospel? The full gospel, the true gospel? Do you believe it is the power of God unto salvation? Let's proclaim that gospel. Let's make Christ known and honor him with our lives all the gratitude and all the thanksgiving that we have for our great, awesome Savior. Let's pray. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nbbc.com.